Today we're going to begin the investigation of one of my favorite forms of English literature and as represented by my bookshelf probably and probably by your bookshelves at home uh, we're going to start thinking about novels and the novel kind of as such as we think of it today largely uh, begins has significant roots at the beginning of the 18th century and we'll be talking about that in some detail both in this lecture and also in our writings. Nailing down the novel is of course a very challenging thing to do and there are a range of arguments that will say that different versions of the novel can be traced back to earlier points in time all the way back actually to the time um, of, uh, of Apuleius and the Golden Ass and then even even potentially earlier works and I'm not here today to argue about kind of the Ur novel or the original novel or the point of origin for all novels. But what I do want to talk about are some significant developments in terms of English literature and the authors that we've been studying that can give us some context for what we might consider early novels in English or some of the earliest novels in English or some of the earliest novels in English that have been kind of significantly uh, important to the development of the novel um, in the uh, in the in the seventeenth, but also into the eighteenth century. So let's think a little bit about that. A as soon as we finished up with Shakespeare and we started reading people like Johnson and Dunn and Milton and now Bunyan, one of the things you've been seeing is the emergence of the the writer or the author as a literary minded kind of self possessed. Um, business-minded individual. So there's this idea that J that Dunn and Johnson, I guess I kind of sw switched them around there, but they would, in terms of how we read them, they would have this invested interest in promoting themselves as a great writer and a, a producer of great works, which they most certainly both were, and they most certainly you know, were successful in that. But particularly in the case of Johnson, there's this idea that Ben Johnson is presenting himself to you as Ben Johnson, the author. So we have the works of Ben Johnson, that very controversial title, uh, because it has been previously only applied to religious figures and politicians and people of that ilk. So, and their and their and their works. But now we have this poet placing himself before you as a kind of master crafts person, producing these texts that are worth your time and your money. Okay, and that kind of competition uh, for attention and and dollars certainly, I think, is relevant to our investigation of. Um, Milton, who gives us Paradise Lost and a range of other poems in which he's both this beautiful uh, uh, artist, writer, communicator, you know, uh, some would say philosopher, uh, but on the other hand, he's also selling these these texts. So we have the, the, the artist as somebody who is fully engaged in the market. Now this is slightly different than uh, a number of other writers we have considered this semester, and actually some writers who will come later in British literature too, which you'll take next semester if you so choose, um, who have a patron, who have a monarch, who have a wealthy individual that essentially finances their creation of a range of beautiful objects, and I guess some objects not so beautiful. We have these writers directly appealing to the public. Um, we saw this most dramatically with Bunyan, and the Pilgrim's Progress, which we know was a very successful uh, capital venture for the author, uh, who was able to both write his story, get his point across, and entertain a large number of people. Well, this, this brings us to this interesting moment in the history of English literature where we start to have the development of something like a reading public, because we're entering into a period now in the early 18th century where more and more people have the ability to read, have the capacity to read, because you know things like the printing press have had enough time to disseminate across culture and, and societies have transformed enough in the regions that we've been investigating that it's becoming re it's becoming more and more obvious that it benefits different em different kingdoms, different empires, different groups essentially to have a wider body of literate people um, moving around uh, for a whole range of reasons that relate to business and commerce and agriculture. And, Theology as well. Certainly, if you have a Bible that you want to be important in the language of the people, you need people to be able to read it, which is one of the prime forces for literacy in the Western world. Um, okay, so with all of that kind of behind us, we can come back to Pilgrim's Progress and we can say that when we get to the end of 
or when we get to the middle, maybe, of Pilgrim's Progress, we have a question. And that question is, what are we reading? You know, what is this? It, it is not a poem as such. It's certainly, it's an allegory. So if you hold it up next to the Fairy Queen, you can see some trends in terms of how Bunyan is talking about people, places, and things. But we're also aware that the Fairy Queen follows some very intense um, linguistic requirements in terms of the structure of the sonnets and the rhyme scheme and the stresses and all of those kinds of illusions that Bunyan doesn't seem to be worried about at all. So, so what are we, what are we dealing with? And what we're dealing with, I think, once we get into Defoe, um, and we also look at some other writers from around the same time, Samuel Richards being another great example, is the emergence of, of the novel. Okay, And all novel means is something that's new. Uh, it's a new form of communication. Uh, that's, that's why the word is first used. Okay, So when we look at something like Robinson Crusoe, or I can take anything. I'll take uh, The Dead Zone, because it's a book that I like by Stephen King off the shelf. You know, we have a, a novel. It's a new story. It's a new format for communicating to people. It might include poems. It might include lyrics. It includes long sections of prose. And it's relating something fictional to me. And that's really one of the prime questions of the early novel is, well, if we have these long works, these long, you know, uh, works in prose, the question comes up, well, why would anybody read these things? What's the point, particularly to a large audience of readers? Now, when you're writing about theological issues uh, in a very straightforward manner, as Bunyan does, that question may not seem to be all that significant. I read Pilgrim's Progress because I'm interested in these theological notions. I have this theological disposition. I like these evangelical characters or situations. So I really don't need to justify to anybody why I'm reading about Christian going on his adventure to literally the Holy Land. However, if I am a writer and I want to communicate to people without using um, a religious, religiously charged rhetoric or something that is directly invested with the kind of theological edification of a community, there's this question of, well, what am I reading and, and, and why am I reading it and what's the point of it? And this can make us, this can help us understand, I think, what many people would say is something like the basic function of the novel in, um, you know, early to mid 18th century England. And in that context, the novel is generally understood to be a form that lets us represent uh, various cross-sections of society and how it is that characters from various cross-sections interact with each other. And what we're supposed to get from the story, really regardless of what's being detailed or described, is some sense of how it is people should relate to us in society, or how it is certain classes of people, certain types of people, men, women, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, how is it that these people should come together, usually in some kind of dramatic scenario, and they'll represent essentially the multiple layers of a society existing at the same time. Now, there's some of this in Shakespeare obviously, uh, in a lot of Elizabethan theater as well. This idea that I would sit down and watch a, a play, and within the play I would see these interacting characters, and from the show I would get the sense that in a large society, like I would see multiple people re being represented within that society. So if I watch Julius Caesar, or if I watch Hamlet, or if I watch Macbeth, or if I watch The Taming of the Shrew, I'm aware of this broadcast of characters, and I'm seeing how they interact, and I get a sense of what's correct and what's incorrect and, and all of that. The average person, however, can't get to the theater necessarily to sit down and watch a show, particularly once you move beyond the urban centers of, of particular you know, kingdoms or regions. So we have to have a way to essentially communicate stories that show the various interactions of people within society um, in a long, dramatic format. And that gives us, slowly over time, and again, I don't think you can pin it down to say, you know, this is the first novel, or at least I don't think there's much value in that. But if we look at trends in writing, we can begin to see the emergence of things that look like novels. And Daniel Defoe is certainly part of uh, what most people would identify as the catalog of early novelists writing in English. When Daniel Defoe writes, there's all kinds of interesting things that he does that can tell us a lot about where 
his society was um, in relation to novels and, and how it is people justified the reading of novels at the time. So one of the things you'll notice about Defoe, if you read much Defoe, is that there's always this effort to um, kind of describe the world in a semi-realistic fashion. So for example, when you read, if you ever get a chance to read Robinson Crusoe, you'll understand the significance of journaling and you know, uh, minute details, very boring details in some instances where you have a character simply cataloging or, or talking about the minutia of the world he or she, she inhabits. And that's in no way a concern in The Fairy Queen, and it's in no way a concern in, um, in uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, it's really not a concern uh, for John Milton in terms of Paradise Lost. But in the novel, there seems to be, in the early novel, there seems to be this engagement with kind of describing in some detail uh, a realistic setting and a realistic place and then within the context of that we have some sort of fantastical occurrence a shipwreck a, a kidnapping um, you know some other some other thing that kind of pops up dramatic thing that pops up and changes everything and Northrop Fry you know who we talked about uh, at the very beginning of this course says that a lot of those kind of plot you know plot twists and overly dramatic uh, developments in novels are really reminding us of the history of the romance, okay, which we thought about in terms of Arthur, we thought about when we were reading your Thomas of England and Mallory and all those people who were writing these long works but certainly wouldn't have thought of them as novels. They would have thought of themselves as writing in the tradition of the romance. But when we get into the novel, at least the early novel, we see this real struggle, I would say, not everybody would characterize it that way, but I would say between taking you know, the realistic, um, kind of pragmatic world of the reader to a certain extent, and then finding a way to infuse that with some of the fanciful developments that we would associate with the romantic tradition. Okay, so, so the fighting, the, 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 you know, the, the lusting after a partner who can't be near you or loving a partner who can't be near you, adventures, action, all of these kinds of things that people don't tend to experience in their day-to-day -day lives, but which are very dramatic and exciting. Well, we have a whole audience of people by the beginning of the 18th century who are very much primed for these kinds of stories. And they're primed for these kinds of stories because we have, at this point, over a century of, of wonderful developments in the English theater or in theaters across England where very dramatic stories are told. If you go back to Shakespeare, one of the things you notice, though, about virtually all of Shakespeare's plays and again, this tells you a lot about him, is that virtually all of his plays and all of his characters are royalty, okay? So they're not the average people. There, there's, there's kings and queens and, and princes and dukes and, um, you know, high religious figures. And there are a few commoners kind of spread out in between, but they're, they're not really all that present. So all the dramatic things that happen in many of Shakespeare's plays are happening to the upper echelon of society. And we know that our culture is still very much in, you know, uh, enamored with these kinds of stories today. You don't have to go too far on American television to find something like a soap opera of, you know, rich and powerful people, um, you know, having struggles or difficulties. These are not the average everyday people. But the average everyday people really come to shine, I would say, over time, not, a lit, not, a, not initially. Um, but Defoe um, puts a focus on kind of non, uh, non-royalty, if I can use that phrase, um, to show us their adventure. So in Robinson Crusoe, you have the story of this, this man who very famously um, decides he's not going to stay at home. He's not going to pursue the middle station of life. He's going to go out and have adventures. And he immediately has a bunch of adventures. He becomes very rich and very wealthy with plantations in South America. Uh, and then he's shipwrecked and we all have some sense of the story of Robinson Crusoe uh, once he's shipwrecked on an island. Another great novel by Defoe is Maul Flanders, which is the story essentially of a prostitute um, and how it is she gets through you know, her daily life, how it is she acquires the means she needs to succeed and who it is she deceives and who it is she loves and who it is she rejects in order to have the life that she wants and desires. And again, we have an individual who is not presented in any way as a royal figure or as an elite figure. Now, as you go further on in the novels and you get into the Victorian period and so on, and we'll leave the American situation to the side for a moment, but when you're following novels and what people now kind of just call books kind of lazily uh, in, in America, um, we have, you know, in the Victorian turn, you usually find out that a character, usually a peasant, 
um, actually has this mysterious past that makes them, um, in some sense, an elite member of society. Um, of course, the most well-known, although this is not the Victorian novel example of this, is the moment in Empire Strikes, ba Empire Strikes Back where Luke Skywalker learns that Darth Vader is indeed his father, and that changes everything for him. It's a very dramatic turn, and we see it in a lot of plays from Shakespeare's time as well. The idea that a character or characters would not understand that they are indeed royalty, and then it's revealed that they are indeed royal. Now, let's go back to the ghost of Northrop Fry. Because Fry tells us these kinds of dramatic turns have been around for a real long time, and they've been around in the romance. And if you know the romance, you know that those kinds of scenarios are very common to storytelling for thousands and thousands of years. So the novel, which means new, um, it's not that it's giving us anything that is, you know, by itself uniquely new, any one component that's new, but it's this interesting mashup, okay, of long prose narration featuring, on the average, not all the time, kind of common everyday people, but then these common everyday people begin to have adventures that have been, in centuries before, associated with kings and queens and knights and dukes and all those kinds of things. So there's this idea that the individual, the average everyday person, can have these big dramatic things happen to him or her as well, and it's a it's a wonderful fantasy. Now, I don't know if it's any more likely than for these same kinds of events to happen to the upper echelons of society, but it becomes this dramatic new format. Um, I don't like the word genre very much for reasons that I'll share with you if you ever get into a literary theory class with me, um, but it's this new way of communicating, okay? That's kind of point one. Um, we have the emergence of the novel, but for all the fun and possibility that novels provide us with, um, they are almost, uh, within a very short period of time, uh, shackled. Um, and for a lot, of a lot of readers are shackled by what comes next, and that is that they don't just show us um, people going on romantic adventures in society. But they also, for a long period of time, are understood to be useful pretty much as a teaching tool to show people of a certain class and gender how it is they should act and interact in the world. So we have a long period, well into the 19th century, arguably into the present day period as well, where novels are used to educate uh, young people, uh, generally, uh, historically women, on how it is they should interact in society in terms of other classes, in terms of um, you know fulfilling pursuits that are proper to their place and station, and all kinds of issues come up there. We're just going to scratch the surface today, but the novel you need to know has been one of the most effective tools for kind of crafting people's conception of uh, life as it is lived by speakers of English. And you can have positive examples, you can have negative examples, but these long prose narratives have a real long history doing just that. You know, for example, um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and, and come into the contemporary period, um, but you ask yourself, you know, why do so many people uh, get behind and cheer Harry Potter, those novels? And there's reasons to do that. I'm not coming after Harry Potter here, but one of the things you get in Harry Potter, you know, you have these obvious, you know, moral lessons about how friends should interact with each other and what it means to have basically a democratic group of people where it doesn't matter who's smarter or who's stronger, who's richer, or who's poorer, or who's, 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 who's braver, who's more cowardly. You just have this group of people trying to work it out together, right? Which is a very contemporary, you know, notion for a children's novel um, to have. Go back and read Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer and you will not see anything remotely like that. Uh, but what to find is something a lot better, I would argue. But anyway, not here to beat up on J.K. Rowling as her novels are also really entertaining. And Rowling is wonderful at using, you know, classical images, classical illusions, and also kind of mining consistently the history of the romance in the long prose, really long prose narrative form um, to entertain millions of people in a wonderful way, as is the case with virtually everybody on the shelf, shelves behind me. And it's probably the case on the shelves that you have at home or on your Kindles or e-readers or however you're accessing this information. So Defoe gives us, doesn't give us, but Defoe is an individual who's often associated with the birth of the novel. Um, other people from the time period who were also significant, or at least someone who's kind of writing around the same time, if not a little bit after, uh, Defoe is Samuel uh, Richardson, who gives us Clarissa and Pamela. Uh, 
Uh, Pamela is probably the best example um, I can think of of the moment uh, of, of a novel that's kind of designed to teach young women how they should live their lives. Written by a man, let's not even worry about that. Uh, but you can see a real clear example of that if you ever get to read Pamela. Clarissa um, uh, does that as well. Clarissa is also interesting in that you know one of the one of the things novels begin to do, um, and for the reasons why novels have kind of a taboo uh, status in society, despite their um, despite some of the best efforts of some of the least imaginative authors, is, is their ability to tackle taboo subjects. For example, in Carissa, you have the subject of rape that's tackled, um, which is not a subject that um, you know, has come up um, in many texts that we've read so far, but was certainly significant to a large number of people uh, who would have read these texts. Um, you have, you have uh, people in places and civilizations that don't get a lot of face time in plays or poems. Uh, represented in novels. Uh, Robinson Crusoe gives us uh, the representation, albeit an incredibly racist representation, of, of the cannibal or the islander. Uh, Friday, you might know the story of Friday, the character Friday, not the day, uh, from Robinson Crusoe. So the novel is this really versatile format for communicating social values to a broad audience with various uh, levels of literacy. So you can give a novel to somebody with low reading skills, you can give a novel to somebody with more advanced reading skills, and they can begin to enjoy these texts together. What's the foundation here for many of these readers? Well, for many of these readers, the foundation is the English version of the Bible. And then it is texts like Paradise Lost and Pilgrim's Progress that gives us these stories around the Bible. Um, and we should be paying very close attention to the fact that these stories draw heavily from the romance uh, and from storytelling traditions that are central to the romance, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start this course with um, with uh, with Fry's commentary on the, the structure of story and the significance of the romance. Now, one more thing to say here, because there's also another, arguably, there's something really interesting that happens in novels or that begins to happen in, happen in novels and is actually now so common in novels that we'd never think about it twice. One of the really fascinating things about novels is that they have the ability to dramatize two things happening at the same time. Let me give you a real general example of that. So you could have chapter one, which takes place Sunday morning, and you could have chapter two, which also takes place Sunday morning, but chapter one deals with characters in one location, and chapter two deals with characters in another location. And when I read those two chapters, what I get a sense of is these two things happening at the same point in time. Now that might be something that doesn't strike you as remarkable at all. But if you go back to many of the texts we've read this semester, that hasn't literally not been in the vocabulary of the authors that we have considered. The idea that you could have a storytelling format capable of jumping forward and backward in time in that way. Certainly we have stories that give us flashback, um, which that happens all the way back to the Iliad and the Odyssey, so there's nothing new there. But in the novel, more and more frequently, we have these moments of time that are either the exact same, separated by you know chapters or other kinds of breaks, or we have um, overlapping events. And authors begin to use this to make stories more dramatic and uh, to help give a broader perspective on what's happening in a society at a given point in time. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for this. Um, and the main argument I'm referencing here comes from a guy named Benedict Anderson's uh, very well-known book, Imagine Communities, which I'd recommend to anyone, particularly the first chapter. Um, but we have as well, when the novel begins to emerge, a whole new notion of time starting to emerge. And um, we, I'll probably be talking about that in a later moment. But in terms of what's real significant from this lecture, I just want you to see that the development of the marketplace, um, you know, increased levels in literacy, um, Vulgate or English versions uh, of the Bible, um, all of these things laid the, found, the foundation for a body of kind of eager readers in society. And by understanding that, we can understand the novel in a little bit better context. All of that takes me to my final point. Why is it, as surely you know growing up, that so many people say it's important to read, it's good to read, read any novel you want, it's good for you to read. I'm not saying that they're wrong, because they're probably not, 
But the whole history of the novel is that it informs people with a broader view of their society and how it is people should act and interact in society. Um, the Gothic novel, of course, we could also talk about, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, but in terms of the novels that you grew up, the librarians who welcomed you into their libraries, the people who told you that reading novels was good and a, a good way to spend your time is how I spent most of my youth growing up. Um, one of the things you might understand is that the novels itself, as a concept, has this whole history. And fundamental to that history is the idea the novel can tell you about the world people live in, and it can tell you about how people should act and interact. Not necessarily a concern of Hamlet. Not necessarily a concern of Paradise Lost. Not necessarily a concern of the Fairy Queen. Not necessarily a concern even of Beowulf, if you want to go way back. Not necessarily a concern of a vast number of texts, um, many of a number of which we've also read this term. So I'll shorten up here because we're running out of time, but the novel's exciting. Uh, I find it to be very exciting, and, I, and uh, we're going to read a little excerpt from a novel. We're not going to get into an actual novel here, but surely you have read novels, uh, many of them, or you probably wouldn't be in this class. Uh, anyway, best of luck, and I look forward to seeing what you produce about this text.